Hello there and welcome to Community Life. Here we talk with the community experts about their life journeys and learn from each other. And today we have a conversation with Jeffrey Roy, a head collectioner, a huge Incubus and Deftones fan, half okay. Irish and half Puerto Rican, a video producer and a great expert in the community world. So hello, Jeffrey. Hello, Yuri. Thanks for having me on. Super happy to talk to you. And like Jeff like or Jeffrey? Like, how do you uh, prefer people to name you? I, I always say, let's go with Jeff. Uh, I always say, uh, you know, it's just one one less syllable to worry about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. I understand you. So, Jeff, the dead guy gets drunk and late. Like, what? Tell me more about this fun yeah. time funeral <laughs> home video. Yeah, that. Um, so that that's an old project that I worked on um, back in. I want to say it was two thousand and nine. I was living in uh, New Jersey at the time. I'm originally from the New York, New Jersey area, and I attended a viral video workshop that was being hosted by a video production company in New York City. Uh, so. The objective of the workshop was basically to try and teach you how to how to create a viral video. And of course, it's not really something you can teach because you never know what's going to go viral on the Internet. But they made their attempt to try and uh, show us how to create viral videos in this workshop, basically by saying, well, you have to create a funny video. So I said, OK, I said to myself, uh, you know, I guess we're we're going to be working on a comedy sketch of sorts. Uh, so uh, they what they did with the workshop group is they they split us all into smaller groups of maybe five to seven people. And uh, I went ahead and took a stab at writing up a quick sketch for a, a commercial for a funeral home that uh, makes your funeral into a party. Uh, and I shared it with my group. Everybody really loved it after they read it. And they said, this is what we have to do. Uh, so we went ahead and... Uh, and shot it in in Jersey City, where where I was raised. Um, most of the, all the interior shots were all in my apartment at the time, um, and all of the exterior shots were in surrounding areas in in Jersey City. So everything from the cemetery in the beginning to the bar that we walk into at the end, um, that's all like in the Jersey City area. And uh, and it worked out pretty well. Um, what they did was after everybody submitted their their sketches or their viral videos, um, they put them up on the internet and they had they opened it up to public voting and and my group ended up winning the competition. Uh, it was a cool experience. It was like maybe a three or four week workshop. And it, the interesting thing about it was that the proctor of the workshop uh, is a gentleman by the name of James Murray, who if uh, if there's anyone out there who's a fan of the show Impractical Jokers, uh, he's uh, the guy on that show. His name is his his nickname is Murr, but his his full name is James Murray. And at the time, uh, he and his his uh, comedy troupe is a he has an improv comedy troupe called the Tenderloins. And at the time, it was 2009. It was before Impractical Jokers was actually a show on TV. They were actually in the process of uh, still like shopping the show out to different networks to see if anyone wanted to buy it. Um, so they 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 hadn't launched the show yet, and I guess this was something that Murr was doing on the side. Um, so yeah, it, uh, it it was good to have that experience, and and then to see uh, James and and the rest of his his group go on to create this show that's become so big now. You know, it has a great fan base. They go on like live tours and and they tour the country. Um, so it's just really exciting to have had that interaction with him before he got all big and famous. <laughs> you can yeah. tell like, we made it, we made them. Because... Yeah, yeah, we did that. We did that before, you know, we got to collaborate before you hit it big. <laughs> How did you come up with this idea of for the commercial? Um, honestly, I, I was really just trying to think of something silly uh, that uh, what would would strike a chord and, and be something that was a little bit outrageous. It, if you watch it, it's very much in the vein of like Weekend at Bernie's because, you know, you're dealing with a dead person who's like sitting up, propped up and like supposed to be there for a party. 
Um, so it definitely has weekend of uh, weekend at Bernie's vibes to it. Um, but I ended up finding out like shortly after we made the sketch that there are actually people specifically in, in Puerto Rico as well, that like they, they have their funerals in that way where they'll have, instead of the person being laying in a casket, you know, they'll have like, I read an article about someone in Puerto Rico who had their, their funeral and this person who passed away was a big motorcycle fan. So when they had his funeral, he was like sitting on his motorcycle with his jacket on and everything like that. And I was like, wow, people actually do this in real life. So that was really um, interesting to find that out afterwards. I can imagine people from Puerto Rico watching this video like, so what? Yes. Yeah. We do, we like, do this all, like all the time. Nothing new. Nothing <laughs> new. Yeah, totally. So what is like for me, personally, it was like kind of both super weird and super funny so i don't know i watched it like five times in a row or something like that so yeah and what is your favorite moment in this video my favorite moment has to be the moment where i actually come out on the video because it that was not planned like i am very much the kind of person who takes the approach of like oh you know i like writing stuff i like producing things because there's a lot of project management work that's associated with being a producer um but it was never my intention to actually have any lines in the sketch uh the part that i come out in the video i was actually giving direction to one of my other my fellow group members on how they should be in front of the camera and i was like you know you have to really he was very this this uh gentleman um his name his name is courtney and he was he was one of my my group members And it was really meant for him to be the one that was very animated, very over the top in front of the camera. But he was so uh, concerned and being a, a, a gentleman about being in my house and doing things like spilling beer on the floor and, you know, having it be this this messy party that he knows that I would have had I, I, I had to clean up afterwards after we we recorded everything. Right. So he was being very, very careful about how uh, over the top he was being. And I was like, don't worry about it. Spill beer on the floor. I'm going to clean everything up afterwards. It's not a problem, but I need you to be like over the top for this, this part of the, of the sketch. And I was doing that to give him an example of how he should be. And they, I didn't realize they were actually recording me and they just decided oh, let's, let's use what Jeff did. So. <laughs> That, that ended up being the, the my favorite part of the video because I wasn't expecting that I was going to come out in it. <laughs> yeah, like improvising stuff. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay, so let's start from the beginning and tell me about your parents. Who are they? My parents. So my parents are uh, Martha Martinez and uh, Jeffrey Rowe Sr. Uh, I'm actually Jeffrey Rowe Jr., so I'm the second. Um But both of my parents were are from the Bronx in New York. Both of my both sides of my family are originally from the Bronx in New York. And uh, uh, I think at some point during my mother's upbringing, uh, she or her mother made the decision. My grandmother moved them from the Bronx to uh, the Upper West Side in Manhattan. So 88th Street and Amsterdam Avenue is where my mother grew up. My mother also has uh, a few siblings. Uh, she has uh, one sister. Uh, her name's uh, Patricia. She has uh, an older brother whose name is uh, Benny Garcia. He lives in California. Uh, and she had another sister named Anna, who unfortunately passed away uh, during her during her youth. So, um, so yeah, it's just the three siblings now. And then uh, on my father's side, also originally from the Bronx, It's my father, Jeffrey Rowe, who's the youngest. Um, he has an older brother named Noel, who um, they both now live down here in Florida near near where I'm, I'm currently residing. Um, uh, he had an older brother named Clayton who passed away. Uh, he uh, has an, an older sister, her name is Dorianne. She still lives in New York in the White Plains area of New York. Um, and then, There was an, an older sister by the name of Missy, uh, who also passed away. So pretty big families on uh, on both sides. Um, 
but I, I ended up being an only child. So, so yeah. So all those presents from uncle and aunts went just for you. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I get the, uh, the spoiled only, only child syndrome, uh, I guess, but I always like to say that, um, although I'm spoiled in the regard that I am loved by many people, it's not the kind of thing that I really try to take advantage of. I was never really like the, the real spoiled only child growing up. Like, Hey, I want this. I want that. You know, I, I always try to be very humble about it. Yeah. So how did your parents meet? How did they meet? So they actually met through um, my grandmother on my father's side. So my father's mother and my mother uh, used to work together. Hmm. Uh, and my mother, her her career has primarily been in finance. So she's worked at a lot of different uh, big finance companies throughout her career. She's actually currently working with UBS. Um, and uh and yeah her and my grandmother used to work together they were really good friends for a long time and that's how she met my father was through uh through her mother-in-law <laughs> yeah like hey come on i want to you i want here's you to meet my, here's somebody. my son isn't, yeah, he, like, well, isn't he pretty <laughs> come, and, come and date him uh yeah it was that was an interesting way for them to meet i'm sure that when they made the transition from from friends to uh, romantic partners, I'm sure that was an interesting time. Uh, I, there might have been a little bit of uh, bumps in the relationship, uh, being that they were friends first. And it's like, oh, now you want to date my son? <laughs> um, so I, I think that probably made for an interesting dynamic between the three of them. But, uh, you know, uh, my mother uh, loved my, my grandmother on my father's side very much. They were very close friends. Um, and they, you know, as, aside from working together, they would spend time with each other outside of the office. They would go for drinks together and have dinner together and all of these fun things. So they really had a, uh, a genuine friendship that existed outside of work. So, uh, you know, what, you know, whatever, whatever little growing pains they might've had once we found out, oh, wow, he's dating my son. Um, I'm sure they got past that quite easily. So. Okay, no worries. Like, I know, I know, I knew about that. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So, being one child, what did your childhood look like? Uh, what did my childhood look like? Um, my childhood, I want to, I want to say, was uh, was very pleasant. Uh, I grew up going to Catholic school, uh, pretty much all my life. Um, it, the school that I went to from, from pre-K all the way through eighth grade was this school called St. Peter's Elementary School that was right across the street from where the apartment that I grew up in. So going to school, um, you know, from a, from a pretty early age, I want to say maybe about from the time I turned like 10 years old, um, I was going to school by myself, you know, because it was right across the street. Um, so had that sort of, you know, had a key to the apartment, you know, early on in, in my, in my childhood, I, I, although I, I did spend some time in after school programs, waiting for my mother to get out of work, that kind of deal. Um, but school was always fun. Um, my, uh, my parents were really great to me. They were always there for me. They, uh, their relationship ended when I was about five years old. So they, they split up when I was five. Um, but my father was always very present in my life. He, um, he made time to make sure that, you know, we got to spend quality time together, even though he wasn't living with us anymore. Uh, he used to plan his entire calendar year around, you know, when we would be visiting with each other. Typically it was every other weekend I would spend with him. And then, you know, for holidays, we would alternate you know, every other year I would spend Thanksgiving or Christmas with him, that kind of deal. Um, so my upbringing was 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 very good. I, I, um, I have a lot of good memories of, of my parents and of uh, the immediate side of my family on my mother's side, uh, because I spent a lot of time with them. Uh, my I have on my on my mother's side of the family, I have my I mentioned her her younger sister, Patricia. Uh, so there's my my aunt and my uncle, 
uh, that both live in Jersey. They had two kids. So I have two cousins who I really look at as siblings because I'm an only child. Uh, I guess I gravitate towards my cousins, especially the ones that that I'm closest with. Um, so their first child, her name's Cassandra. She is uh, kind of like a sister to me. Uh, we, we grew up together. Uh, we're maybe like six years apart. So we definitely got to spend a lot of our childhoods together um, and definitely had that brother sister rapport. You know, I would yeah. antagonize her to death and, uh, you know, and she would hate it growing up. But we always had a very loving relationship. Um, and I spent a lot of time um, with my aunt and uncle, especially during the summers. Uh, because growing up in Jersey City, it's a very urban area, uh, very city. And it's like right across from uh, New York. It's right across the Hudson River. Uh, just to give you some context, uh, during 9-11, when the Twin Towers fell, uh, when, when the buildings crashed and they, and they fell down, you could feel the ground shaking in Jersey City. That's how close we are to New York. Mm -hmm. So growing up in that area, very city environment, um, and my aunt and uncle used to live in Central Jersey. They still live in Central Jersey, but a little further south now. But they used to live in a town called Somerset, New Jersey, which is close to New Brunswick, for anyone who knows Jersey. Um, and I used to spend a lot of summers over there just to be a little bit away from the city environment, be in a little bit more of a suburban kind of area. And my, uh, my aunt and uncle had a uh, they used to live in an apartment that had a swimming pool so it was very it was a lot more fun for me to go and spend time over there during the summer rather than being in the city and going to uh, some of the public pools that are uh, <laughs> in the local area because they get they get a little bit crowded um so spent a lot of time uh with them in jersey in the summers growing up but also spent a, a lot of time with my grandparents too because they at the at the time when i was growing up they were still living in New York City uh, on the Upper West Side. So I got to spend a lot of time with them during the summer and, you know, go to play basketball with my grandfather and things like that. So I had a, I had a fun upbringing I, and I um, I have a lot of good memories from from my childhood. So I, I try to, you know, keep those near and dear. And even to this day, uh, you know, when I when I think about my my grammar school years before I, I got to high school, uh, th this ring that I always wear, I still wear to this day, um, is my eighth grade graduation ring. A anytime anyone sees me wearing this graduation ring, they always look <laughs> at it and they're like, oh, is that from high school or college? And I'm like, nope, it's from grammar <laughs> school. It's from eighth grade. And I still wear it. I, I feel like uh, elementary school was probably the funnest time of my life. Um uh, I always tell people as a joke, I'm like, yeah, that was the time of my life before I started liking girls. That, that's when everything went crazy. Once once I started noticing girls, then forget it. everything went downhill. Before <laughs> then, I was carefree and, and living living my best life. <laughs> so this ring is kind of a reminder, reminder for you, like how how the time felt like. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And you you told that you have a lot of great childhood memories. So what is the first memory jumping into your mind right now? Um, the first one, I, I would say uh, anytime I had like birthdays growing up, uh, those were always fun times. Um, I think in the first few years where we would have parties, where we would invite people to come to my birthday party, we would do things like, oh, we're, we're going to have Jeffrey's birthday party in, um, you know, at the local Burger King because they have a nice playground area. Um, so, yeah, you know, everybody can get their food and and we can cut a cake there and then everybody can go on the on the uh, in the playground area and go down slides and, you know, climb the monkey bars and all that fun stuff. So there was a lot of that in uh in the first few years where we would have big parties and then um and then as things as the years went on and i got into my preteens, uh we would we would start having birthday parties at my aunt's house remember i used to say my, my aunt had, was living in an apartment building that had a pretty big swimming pool um so outside of the swimming pool area of course they would have like barbecue pits and stuff like that so we would have the birthday party by the pool, 
and, you know, cooking burgers and, you know, having chicken and things like that, barbecuing stuff. So uh, those were fun parties where, you know, I was actually able to get my classmates to make the trip to because that that was a maybe a half hour, 45 minute drive away from Jersey City where I lived. Uh, so getting to like invite my classmates and having some of them get to show up was was a fun experience for me. Um, outside of parties that were specifically for me, uh, some of the other cool memories that I had growing up w that involved also involved parties uh, was just going to family house parties that we would have. Uh, in addition to my grandmother living in the Upper West Side of New York, I also had uh, family on my stepfather's side. So my uh, my mother and uh, and my stepfather got together shortly after she split from my father and uh, and my my stepfather's Dominican. So I'm I'm also kind of Dominican by association. Uh, and growing up, the uh, uh, Dominican side of his family lived on a little bit further than the Upper West Side of, of Manhattan is a section called Washington Heights. And Washington Heights has a lot of Dominican people there. Uh, and we would go to these house parties with the family where there was always great food, a lot of music, people dancing, things like that. And it was just so funny that I would be at these parties and uh, as loud as the music was, I would always get to a point in the evening where I would fall asleep and I would fall asleep right next to a speaker that's like <laughs> blasting this merengue and bachata music. And I'm, it's, it's blasting, but I'm there just knocked out. It's like, I guess, you know, it would get to the, a, a certain point in the evening where maybe the food would kick in or something and I would just fall asleep right next to the music. So those are always fun memories for me too. Yeah, you're not that kind of person who will like shout like, quiet, quiet everyone. No, I'm okay. just... You guys yeah, keep partying. I'm going to take a nap. Yeah. <laughs> like right in right, right on the scene, so... Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Why did you want to make movies while growing up? Oh my gosh! Um, so the the desire, the the affinity towards film and video production for me as as a young person, uh, it was kind of an evolution. Uh, admittedly, the first thing that I wanted to be when I was a child, I wanted to be Hulk Hogan. I wanted to be a professional wrestler. <laughs> uh, but that was that was more of a childhood fantasy for me. Uh, but I really was a big fan of Hulk Hogan when I was like five years old. But after that, um, I, uh, I I definitely at some point, I'm not sure when or how I picked it up, but I had it in my mind that I wanted to be an actor. And as, the way I remember it is that it started with, okay, I want to be an actor. Um, I think part of that influence was uh, early on in, in my upbringing, I became a big fan and I'm still a huge fan of John Leguizamo uh, to this day, um, really one of my heroes. Um, so maybe watching some of his earlier work growing up put that sort of like, oh, you can kind of do this acting bug inside my head. I remember even uh, at one point uh, during my schooling, where I had done at least one performance for the entire school where it was just me. Um, and I was doing this sort of one man sketch in front of the whole school in the auditorium uh, where I did a parody of Mary Had a Little Lamb, but I, I kind of co-opted it to be Mario Had a Little Lamb. And I was actually enacting a young boy on his way to school with a lamb following him uh, and just making his life a, a total wreck, right? Like he's trying to go to school. He has this lamb. It's like eating his snacks and his lunch food and things like that. And just making his life uh, very difficult to try and his commute to school quite difficult. Uh, that's, that's at least how I remember it. And somehow I made that into a funny little uh, one man live sketch uh, that, that had the school laughing. So I think it, it went from that to as I got into my preteen years and into my teen years, uh, I was a huge fan of the show Dawson's Creek. And uh, if anyone knows that show, uh, 
the main character Dawson, played by James Vanderbeek, was a huge fan of Steven Spielberg and wanted to become a director. So once I started watching that show, that became my whole mantra. It was like, okay, yeah, I want to be a director. I want to make movies, things like that. And then as I started to pursue that more seriously, when I first started college, I uh, even though I, I ended up graduating with a marketing degree, but when I initially started school, I was going to be a film major. And uh, I was... I was working my first entry level job at the same time that I was going to school. Uh, and my parents kind of put the bug in my head of like, hey, if you're going to invest this money in a degree, don't go with a, a major that's going to pigeonhole you into one industry. You kind of want go go with a degree that you're that you can kind of take it into any industry. Um, so I thought about that for a while and I was like, you know, they do have some practical points. Uh, so I, I made the pivot over to marketing, but I still had the opportunity to minor in media arts. So I still got to take all of those classes like video production, sound production, screenwriting, things like that. So it was a good balance of, you know, the professional and the creative together. Um, ultimately, I think where I ended up finding my sweet spot was... You know, I like writing things. I like being a producer because of the project management skills that are needed in order to be effective in that role. So I think that's kind of where I would, uh, you know, I, I always try and make time to pursue uh, passion projects whenever possible. So um, whenever I'm involved in creative endeavors that involve video production, um, yeah, that's that's my sweet spot. Writing and producing, I feel like, uh, are closest to um, the things that I really enjoy. What was the latest video you've produced? It's been a while. Um, actually, it hasn't been a while, but it's been a while since I've worked on something that I actually felt comfortable putting out into the world. <laughs> um, and there was a, there was at some point last year when I first got to Florida, I was in search of communities for people who uh, are into video production, want to work on small projects together. And I found a meetup group in my uh, in my local area for folks that uh, want to work on short video projects, video production projects together. Uh, and they uh, they meet, I think, once a week. And uh, we 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 at one point were working on a video that was kind of centered around COVID. Um, it, it's interesting because the, the gentleman who is the leader of this meetup group, he's an older gentleman and he, uh, came up with the concept to do this video for, uh, someone who had to dine outside because of COVID or maybe I think he had COVID. So he's like, he's going to a party, but he has to stay outside and, and, have yeah. kids outside and, and he sees the party inside uh, going on and everyone's inside having a good time, but he has to stay outside. I think it might have been because he wasn't vaccinated or something like that. Um, so there's there's like funny elements to it, but it wasn't necessarily crafted to be a funny video. It was more uh, crafted to be a awareness video about COVID, if that makes sense. And uh, I was playing the guy who's outside and can't be a part of the party. Um, so, you know, we worked on it. We came to my apartment to shoot it and everything like that. Uh, and and it, it all went well. But again, like, I don't necessarily like being the guy in front of the camera. I like being the guy behind the camera and you know, making sure everything's going well, everyone's happy and and doing what they need to do. Um, so I, I wasn't really uh, very eager to say, hey, yeah, let's edit this and put it on YouTube because it was mostly me and I, was, I just didn't like the way I looked. And it was, I was like, no, we're not going to do this. <laughs> that, so that's technically the last thing that I worked on. But the last thing that I worked on that I actually felt... Um, you know, proud enough to say, hey, let's, yeah, yeah, let's put this out there. There was the the Fun Times Funeral Home video. I think that was 2009. So it's been a quite a long time since 
I've had the opportunity to really work on something that that I'm confident enough to put out there into the world. Um, but prior to that, I had uh, worked on a music video for Incubus. Uh, it was two, uh, 2007, I believe. They were having a music video contest for one of their singles, this song called Dig. And, um, and they opened up this contest to all of their fans. They shot footage of themselves performing the song in front of a green screen. And they gave the footage to the fans and they said, you know, you guys can do whatever you want with this footage, um, edit it however you want. And we're going to take all of your submissions. And the, the one that that we like the best is going to become the official video for the song. Um, so I tried my best at um, at doing that. It was the first time that I had a uh, key to green screen. So, so this is the first time that I actually took green screen footage and tried to edit it. Um, it came out a little poor. It was it was my first time, very amateur looking. I I did not match the the background, like what I was actually shooting. It didn't fit in perfectly with the green screen. So there are moments in the video where you're like you're seeing them perform, but then there's craziness happening in the background in terms of where the camera's looking and everything like that. Um, but the cool thing about getting to do that project was that even though I didn't win, um, because of the fact that I participated in the contest, I got to get free tickets to go see them in concert live and uh, VIP passes to um, hang out with them after the show. So that was cool. I brought my friend with me and we went to the show and then afterwards we got to meet all of them and and say hello and all these good things. So it was, it was definitely worth at least trying <laughs> yeah how did you feel when you met them in this VAP, using this vip pass oh i i felt great i felt great i mean they're they're uh definitely um definitely one of my musical heroes that are that are out there i've been following them since since i was about 15 or 17 years old something like that so it's been it's been over 20 years that I've been following this band and I've got I've had the opportunity. I've been lucky enough to meet them at different points in their career. So I have I have a number of, of fun memories and, and fun stories where I, I've gotten to to meet them. So I've just been really lucky uh, to have been following them so closely that I've it's turned into opportunities for me to meet them in person at different points throughout their career. Um, and that's that's true of both Incubus and Deftones. I just, I guess I'm, I'm one of those. Uh, like I'm a I'm a fanboy, you know. I just really I really follow them that that closely. Uh, people make fun of me sometimes. They're like, "Oh wow, you're like a groupie," and I'm like, "Well, yeah, <laughs> I, I kind of am." <laughs> Why do you love them? Um, I would say that the the music just really resonates with me. Um, if uh, I think if, if anyone had to uh, take a stab at saying if he likes one more than the other, I pr I'd probably favor Incubus a little bit more than Deftones. But the two together, if you really listen to their music, uh, both lyrically and melodically, uh, sonically, uh, they're to me, they're kind of like a yin and yang. Incubus is... Although they are an alternative rock band and they do have some of their music, especially some of their earlier music, that's a little heavier. Um, they have that rock element to them, but Incubus is a lot more melodic and softer in a lot of ways than Deftones, which is a little heavier and a little darker. Uh, so the two of them together is kind of like a yin and yang kind of relationship. But um, but yeah, both of the their music resonates with me very heavily and is kind of like the soundtrack to my life but i uh I'm, I'm a big music fan in general so i my when it comes to my taste in music i have a very wide palette um for music uh so i listen to a lot of everything uh i think if i'm thinking about it from my parents perspective and the influences that they've had on my musical taste i would say that i got a lot of the um my affinity for genres like r&b music hip-hop um jazz soul music latin music 
all, all of that comes from my mother. Um, and then my affinity for rock music, classic rock, alternative, any genre, any, any flavor of rock music comes from my dad. Um, so yeah, I think the two together makes for a pretty eclectic uh, range in genres of music that I listen to. But I am a very, very, very um, big music fan. I go to a lot of live shows and uh, I have a shoebox in my closet uh, that's just filled with all of the concert tickets that I've gone to over the years. I'm sure at some point I'll take some of the, at least some of them and, you know, make, make a collage of sorts where I can just hang something up in my room or somewhere in my, in my house to say, wow, you know, like, look at all those shows you went to. Um, but yeah, I've had a lot of really great memories going to, uh, to live shows throughout my, throughout my life. Are you opening that box from time to time to remind yourself where you've been? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I'll uh, I'll dig through and uh and that the the box not just doesn't have um concert tickets alone. Uh there's also movie ticket stubs that are in there. There's also uh tickets from theater shows that I've been to over the years. Uh playbills from Broadway shows that I've seen when I especially when I used to live in the in the New York New Jersey area so there's it's a pretty good way for me to like in case I forget remind myself of all the places that I've been to uh because of my love for music the arts theater all of that good stuff so what matters to you more lyrics or music or melody That's a that's a super good question. Um, I want to say lyrics. Um, I think that lyrics add uh, a layer to, to songs that, um, that melodies be, I think, I think the, the, the sonics of a sound and the melodies of a sound are what triggers an initial emotion. And it's like, Oh, okay. I like this. I like the way it sounds. Let me, let me, dig a little bit deeper into this and see if there's anything more to this that I can, uh, that might resonate with me. Um, and I think from there, you're then, you're then drawn to the lyrics. And once you listen to a song, especially if it's a song that, that, uh, piques your interest melodically or sonically. Um, and then you're, you're then hearing that while reading the lyrics to a song, um, that add that takes it to the next level and adds another layer to it where it's like oh wow now now not only is this song you know appealing to me sonically but the words in this song are telling a story that that resonates with me or maybe if it's not even telling a coherent story the words are resonating with me for one reason or another um and i'm able to make sense of of the lyrics to this song because of how how I'm able to relate to it through my my own lived experiences, um, so I, I yeah I would definitely pick lyrics for sure. And would you stop listening to the song if you like music but don't like lyrics? Um no, no because there's definitely some songs that I'm a fan of that I still don't necessarily know what the hell they're saying on the song. <laughs> You know, where it's like I there's probably a good handful of songs that I've been singing for years that I've just been phonetically enunciating the lyrics, but I haven't really paid attention to what they're actually saying. So hopefully none of those songs are like uh, incriminating to me or I'm singing something that could potentially be deemed offensive or something like that. Um, but yeah, I, I definitely think that there's room for both. Uh, you definitely have to have songs that you just like just because you like the way it sounds and, and the way it makes you feel. Um, so yeah, there's definitely room for both. You kind of reminded me a little of the song uh, Freestyler by Bon Funk MC. And like, I didn't know what they were saying, but I was like, always like, rock a muck a four. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I catch myself doing that all the time where I'm like, Oh wow, you're really just going, ah, da, 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 you know, and you think you're you, you think you're saying the lyrics, but you're not. <laughs> you're totally not. 
recently you've shared that leaving Jersey City was one of the best decisions uh, you've made in your life. Yes. So why so? Um, I think there's a, a, a few reasons for that. Um, I think that at the time that I left Jersey, I was at a point in my career that I felt like I wasn't really making any forward progress. Um, it kind of felt like I was, the jobs that I was getting at the time were kind of just lateral moves. Um, so there was a little bit of career frustration that I was experiencing at the time. Um, there was also the fact that uh, I was still living at home with my mother at the time. Um, so I was I was already uh, crossed over into my 30s. I was in my young, my my early 30s. And I was just getting that itch of like, oh my gosh, like I need to, I need to get out on my own. I need to be in my own space. I need to not be that guy that's over 30 and still living at home with mom. Uh, so there was that element to it as well. Um, and I, I wanted to go out and forge a path of my own and, and just throw, throw my stake in the ground and start building something that I could call my own. Um, so I, I've been able to do that, fortunately. Uh, I think, you know, taking that leap uh, is uh, is a, a way of putting it out there into the universe, putting your intentions out into the universe. Um, and when once you do that, the, the universe responds back in kind and says, OK, you know, uh, you know, we'll we'll make the room for you to have that. And for you to create that path of your own and, and build something that you can call your own, we'll create the space for you to do that. And you'll be supported because you had the courage to, you know, take that leap. Um, so I, I didn't want to be the kind of person that, uh, number one, just stays in his hometown his entire life. Uh, I wanted to step outside of my comfort zone. I wanted to uh, explore what else might be out there for me. Um, and, uh, yeah, I found myself, uh, gravitating towards Texas at the time I, I left Jersey and I was living in Austin, Texas for uh, about three years. Um, it kind of started with uh, a long distance relationship that I was in at the time. Uh, but I also, once I was involved in that dynamic, I also was doing research into the job market in, in Texas. And of course, Austin has a very thriving tech scene. Um, and I thought there might be opportunity for me out there. And luckily that, you know, the universe created that space for me. And there was career opportunity for me out there. Uh, my time at Coros, I always speak very highly of it. Um, shout out to all of my, my previous co-workers on the strategic services team at Coros. Uh, love and miss them very much. Um, so I had a wonderful time doing that. And, uh, and I just kept following that path and seeing, you know, what was next for me when, when my time in, in Austin came to a close, uh, you know, there was another calling that was out there in the universe for me. Uh, right now I'm living in St. Petersburg, Florida, which is, um, my apartment is maybe 10, 15 minutes away from where my father lives. And uh, in 2020, on top of everything else that was going on, all the craziness with COVID, uh, I found out that my father was diagnosed with a form of cancer. So I uh, wanted to make myself available to, to be close to him in case he needs me. Uh, and I made the decision to relocate to St. Petersburg. Like I said, I'm, I'm 10, 15 minutes away from him. So luckily, his health has been holding up quite well. Um, There's some things that are on the horizon for him this year that are going to uh, help to uh, help his condition to, uh, you know, to remedy his, his condition and get him better. Uh, so, you know, I'm excited for this year and I'm, and I'm glad to be in, in a position where I'm able to help him. Um, so, yeah, uh, I think that taking that leap of, of going out there and, and making the, the concerted effort to build something of my own, uh, has been beneficial for my personal growth, my professional growth, uh, and has uh, allowed for the universe to give some of that back to me uh, in in the form of, you know, being close to friends and, and loved ones. 
How do you read the signs of the universe? That's a really good question. I feel like they make themselves known to you. Um, when you're when you're focused and and when you're focused on putting purposeful intentions out into the universe, uh, you're able to notice when the universe is speaking back to you, uh, in my opinion. Um, and I, I think I think part of this has to do with uh with the fact that i i like i like to think that i am in a daily practice of of what might be referred to as transcendental meditation where you are just in the practice of being very aware of your surroundings of what you're doing in the moment as you're doing it so rather than taking the time of course, it's always beneficial to take the time to be quiet and still and close your eyes and allow for uh, allow for your you to come back to your center and, and you know, sort of dissociate from your your thought process. Um, those that's an, a, always a beneficial way to meditate. But I like to think about meditating as I'm going about my daily activities. Um, and then there's a when you're doing that and you have that element of awareness as you're executing on your daily tasks and things like that, you're more easily able to notice, oh, OK, this is something that connects very well to this other thing that I did earlier in the week or earlier in the day. Um, maybe I should connect those two dots. Um, so it's kind of like the universe drops these little clues and it's up to you to connect those dots together. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> totally. And tell me more about your oil game, little shrine, and all that monk shit, as you once called it on the Instagram post. Um, refresh my memory because I'm I I might be drawing a blank on that. Um, you did had you a say little shrine with Buddhas? Etc. Yes, and you had some oils. So yes, 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 yes. I'm that might you might be referring to uh, an Instagram post where I I I might have photographed a number of like little Buddha statues that I have. I have a ton of little Buddha statues all around my apartment. I'm looking at my my desk right now, and I have this little Buddha. Um, it's this is an incense. Uh, an incense holder that's supposed to hold like the incense cones, like the yeah. little triangle cones. So those are supposed to get propped up on here. And then you're supposed to see the incense trickle down here like a waterfall. Mm. Uh, so I have a whole bunch of those things. I have a bunch of crystals on my on my desk that that I keep around just to keep energies um, high and and uh, here's another little Buddha head that I have on my desk. Um, so yeah, I'm very much into uh, into having little Buddhas around me at all times and and keeping uh, keeping a positive sort of environment, very Zen energy, if you will, uh, without digging too far into the weeds of the philosophy side of things, because I'm admittedly not an expert in this area. Uh, but I would venture to say that I consider myself to be a spiritual person for sure. Am I, am I hearing that correct that you find some, um, I don't know, stuff for yourself that helps you to like build better, like cleaner, or I, I don't know how to call it, like better energy. But as you told, without like going really under the, this philosophy. Yeah, yeah, I definitely um I'm a big incense guy. I I I uh I always have a healthy stock of Nag Champa incense in my apartment that I burn at least a few times a day. Um I have uh I have some sage in my apartment that from time to time I'll just go around my apartment and and just burn sage and and just really think about what what my intentions are for from my own life and my own personal growth. 
um, just to keep the the energy feeling feeling good and positive and clean. Um, yeah, it's definitely something that I uh, am uh, am into. I don't know if I'd go so far. You know, I know folks that are really heavy into it to the point where they, uh, you know, they study to become things like Reiki healers or uh, uh, there's um, a lot of folks that become practitioners of these things at a, at a, at a philosophical level. Um, and while I, I absolutely support and encourage that, I don't I wouldn't consider myself an expert by any means. Um, so I, I don't like to. Um, I don't like to preach too much about it, but it's it's something that helps me. Um, so yeah, anyone who's sort of into that thing, I, I kind of, I, I gravitate towards towards all of that. You always have something to talk about. <laughs> for sure, for sure. Tell me about one more of the best decisions you've ever made. Oh my gosh. That is a great question um, because I feel like I've, maybe made a lot i've probably made more mistakes than really good decisions um <laughs> uh, yeah it's it's so, like the normal way of life yeah you know, like. yeah exactly <laughs> exactly um one of the best decisions that i made uh outside of leaving jersey um i mean i think i think the decision to uh this is this kind of piggybacks off of leaving jersey but i'm gonna lean into uh, the decision to leave Austin and go from Austin to Florida as another really good decision because, you know, I'm available to to be on standby uh, for my father in case he needs me for anything. Yeah. I've always been a very uh, family centric sort of dude um, and uh, and really love my family members. And, and I'm just at that point in life where you know, there it's a transition period. I feel like there's another layer of adulthood that's being uh, thrust upon me just because it's that time. Um, you know, I see the elders in my family transitioning into the next chapters of their lives with, uh, with them getting on in years. And uh, if I think about the infrastructure of my family, you know, like I was talking about my cousins and stuff earlier, um, on the on the east coast i'm sort of the eldest you know if we if we talk about after my mother after my father after my aunts and uncles mm -hmm. um and my grandparents um i'm really the the eldest on this on this side of the country uh in terms of my immediate family members so i uh take that very seriously and uh and i think about the future of my family and i want us to maintain that level of closeness that we've always had because of the matriarchs in our family you know the the my grandmother my mother and my aunt are like the three strongest pillars in the family it's very matriarchal structure uh to our family and i think about the day that inevitably they'll not be around to support us in the way that they have during my upbringing uh, and I think about the ways in which I'll have to step up and be a leader for my family, for my cousins, uh, for my daughter. Uh, you know, my daughter's going to be 16 years old this year. Yeah. Um, and that's another person that I need to think about who's on on the East Coast um, as as this family continues to evolve. The next the next iteration, the next generation, the next phase of this family. Uh, what is that going to look like? And, you know, I, I would like to be that that person that keeps us together. How does it feel to be the father of a 15 years old girl? It feels crazy. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's it's definitely been an interesting ride so far. Um, I have a feeling that it's just beginning to get even more interesting uh especially as my daughter gets into her her adolescence into the into the as she ventures into the woods of her adolescence and and gets further into growing into the woman that she's going to be for the rest of her life um i definitely feel an added sense of responsibility to uh 
just be there for her in, in whatever way that I can. You know, one of the things that was a very uh, hard part of making the decision to leave Jersey, of course, was being away from her. Uh, and um, that wasn't a decision that came very lightly to me. It's been very difficult to uh, be as far away from her as I have been. But I like to think that I am setting some kind of an example for her in doing what I'm doing to take care of myself, uh, in doing the things that I need to do uh, to grow into uh, someone that she can look up to and, and someone that can be an example to her. Uh, I want to let her know that, you know, there's life outside of Jersey. I want her to know that there are opportunities for her and that she can uh, that she can do and be anything that she wants to in this life. Um, and it doesn't have to be uh, something that is, you know, your parents telling you, oh, you have to go and and do this or study or get a degree. You know, we have conversations and she's. She's at that adolescent point where she's like, well, why do I have to take the PSATs? And, you know, like, uh, you know, why do I got to do this? And then the other thing I'm like, well, you know, th this is the this is the way that we're we're taught. Go to school, get your degree, all that good stuff. That being said, you know, if if you decide that that's something that's not for you, then I'm totally here to support that as well. But don't think for a second that anything you choose to do is not going to involve hard work. Like you're going to whether you go to school and get a degree or whether you decide you're going to forge a path of your own and and uh, and and create a career doing something that you love and, and have that be a nonlinear path. You're still going to have to work your ass off. So be prepared for that. And I'm here to, to help you out in any way I can. Um, so hopefully, um, some of the things that I'm doing now are, uh, in retrospect for her going to have a positive effect and help inform some of the decisions that she has coming up in her own life. You know, I remember this video when you asked like, Ari, how does it feel to be 14? And she's like, I feel ancient. Yeah. So right. Where did she get <laughs> this great sense of humor? Oh, gosh, I want to say that she probably gets it from both myself and her mother. Um, you know, her mother and I are both very similar in our sense of humor uh, and uh, and our general attitude about life. Um, we're both very gracious individuals. So, yeah, I think she gets that sense of humor from both of us. Uh, and she has maintained it through throughout uh since since then that was her 14th birthday so that was only a couple of years ago but um but yeah she's uh she's got a great sense of humor she's very much into theater these days um i've had the opportunity to see her her first uh her first theater production in high school and most recently she had a winter concert uh at at her high school where uh they did uh, a few a few numbers from high school musical uh, that was pretty cool to check out. And uh, she's very much into books. She's an avid reader. That's something she totally gets from her mother because I'm not a big book reader. Um, my my attention span when it comes to reading is uh, a little bit closer towards like screenplays and more short form, uh, uh, more short form uh, forms of writing. Uh, like I could read a screenplay in, in, in like a, a screenplay in, in one day, but uh, it'll take me months to get through an actual book. Um, so yeah, uh, she's she's a big reader and uh, and she's into the arts. So I, I mean, so far I think she's on the right path. Uh, she's probably very similar to where I was at her age. You know, being someone who's into the arts as much as as much as she is and as much as I was. Um, when I was her age. So I think, I think she's on the right path. She's gonna, she's got a bright future ahead of her. Did you have any conversation about uh, writing and producing stuff? Did she ask you something about that? Um, there was at one point she had asked me about starting a podcast with her friends. Uh, so I, I'm not sure 
how much work they put into developing that. Um, but I definitely let her know that, you know, I, I do have some chops when it comes to writing and I would be totally down to uh, help her out with anything uh, on the creative side of things. So I, I absolutely push her in, in that direction as much as possible. And what is this podcast about? Oh my God, I don't even know. They, I, they haven't even like really, um, they haven't even done a lot to really develop it. So I'm, I'm unsure of what the actual topic would be. I know that they haven't really uh, done much and the, they don't have any episodes that they've recorded or anything like that. Um, I think they started an Instagram account because it's her and two of her girlfriends. Uh, so they have right now they have the makings of a potential podcast, right? They have the click, right? They have, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. They have the, the three girls that are together. Okay. <laughs> so whatever it is that they're talking about in their spare time, I'm sure they would, they would probably have to find some way to translate that into topical conversations that they could have and record and put out there into the public. But at the same time, they're also a little nervous about doing that. So, yeah. you know, I, I don't want to be the overbearing one to really push and say, let's let's produce this podcast. I don't want to be the heavy hand to be like, <laughs> you know, oh, we have to have a format and we have to have our topics selected and do and be the planner because that kind of kills their creativity, too. So I'm just like giving them the room to, you know, sort of marinate in in what it is that they might be doing. Um, in that arena so we'll we'll see if it becomes something i i hope that it does and and i hope that i can help out with it but you know there's still there's still some work to be done I the, can't imagine. when you're I can't when you're imagine. at that age it's you know you're still finding out in the same way that i was finding out okay do i really want to act or do i want to be steven spielberg or am i just watching too much dawson's creek you know like <laughs> you know they got it they got to figure some of the, the logistics out i think yeah Tell me, what is the most valuable sample in your head collection? The most valuable one? Um, that's a really good question. I have only recently gotten back into um, wearing caps a lot. I, I probably used to wear them a lot more in my younger years. Um, and back then it would probably be a lot of like fitted caps and they would probably be just be like all baseball teams. You know, like the Yankees, and I think I used to have a LA Dodgers hat at one point. Uh, but what I found over the years um, was that after I wear my caps a little bit too long, and you know they get a little sweaty, uh, the fitted caps tend to shrink on me. So I've transitioned over to the snapbacks since they're adjustable. Um, but this one in particular is an Adidas one. So I'm a big fan of uh, of Adidas, the brand. Um, a lot of the a lot of the stuff that I wear, uh, you know, sweatpants and basketball shorts and stuff like that. I like Adidas. I think that's uh, probably my favorite uh, athletic brand that's out there. So I have a, a couple of Adidas hats. Um, let me actually, I can grab some of them for you. I have them right back here. Ugh. Here's a whole bunch. <laughs> so, uh, this is a more recent one that I got. It's uh, just a Puerto Rico hat. That's why it has PR and then it has the flag. Yeah. The side. Um, this hat is the brand of uh, Incubus's drummer. He has his own clothing brand. His name is Jose Pasillas. So if you take a look at the logo there, it's JP. Yeah. Um, so that's his clothing brand. Again, another Adidas hat. Uh, this says Goon Squad on it. This is a Deftones hat that I got on their tour from last year. Uh, Goon Squad is actually the name of one of Deftones songs. This is an Incubus hat. It says Pardon Me While I Burst from their song Pardon Me. Um, and then this is another Deftones hat from uh, their album White Pony. So those are just some of the ones that I have. I have some more in my closet, but these are the ones that I'll show you for now. <laughs> so Deftones and Incubus, I understand, but why Adidas? Um, I think, I think part of it is, I think it's mostly connected to music as well. Um, you know, we think about Run DMC, my Adidas, you know, Run DMC kind of put Adidas on the map when it comes to them being a popular 
clothing brand. Um, and that has remained true up all the way from Run DMC all the way to uh, the late 90s alternative rock era of music. Incubus and Deftones were both part of the same music scene from the late 90s that some refer to as new metal. I like to call it alternative rock, call it whatever you want. Um, but even bands like Korn, Korn has a song called Adidas, um, and they turned it into an acronym. I'll, uh, I'll leave, I won't say more on that. I'll just kind of leave that for people who know Korn and know what that song Adidas is uh, about. Um, but yeah, I think that it's something that the music has been able to amplify, um, as uh as part of 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 pop culture american culture music culture all of that good stuff okay now i understand it's all connected to music yeah pretty much for me <laughs> <laughs> okay jeff you know i really wish to have the sky as the limit to our conversation but time is the limit so yes. let's jump to the rapid fire questions all right so, cool. swim in pool or ocean ocean Recorded or live music? Live. What are your favorite color and song? Uh, I like purple and I really like gray. Uh, so I'm going to say purple and gray. And favorite song? Oh my gosh. <laughs> It depends on the day. But for today, I'll just say Wish You Were Here by Incubus. If you were a superhero, what superpower would you have? I would like to fly. I would definitely like to fly. So yeah, I'll go with that. Who do you learn from in the community world? Name one person. Oh my gosh. So many people. You. I know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, right now, I, I want, I'm going to say Ilker. I'm going to say Ilker because... That man is just a plethora of information, and uh, he and I have been collaborating uh, behind the scenes on a, a resource that um, that should be hitting the the community world uh, very soon. So, uh, look, you know, be on the lookout for that if it's not already out by the time this drops. <laughs> okay, I'm I'm all ears. I'm all yes. ears and eyes yes. for sure. Name two people whose community life journey you are happy to hear about, who I basically should to, should have this conversation with. Two people. Um, I'm trying to think of folks who haven't already been on the show. <laughs> um, gosh. Have you, um, have you had the opportunity to speak with Pablo Gonzalez? Has he been on the show yet? He has, hasn't he? I had a feeling. Oh, shout out to Pablo. He's another good guy that, that I But love. It, 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 it's count, you know, like. It, it still counts even if they've been on the show? Sure. I still, I still want to dig. I still want to dig for somebody who hasn't been on the show yet. I know Lori's been on the show. Shout out to <laughs> Lori. She's another great person that, that I love learning from. Um, I'm going to say uh, someone that, who I've. Every time I hear about this person and I learn something new about this person, I am intrigued and I want to learn more. And I don't think she's been on the show. Correct me if I'm wrong. But Regina Walton. Shout out to Regina. Super interesting lady. You know, wealth of experience in the community space. Definitely reach out to her. I want to learn more about Regina. Got it. I also noticed her a lot in the community world, so she's on my list for sure. Excellent, excellent. And is there one question that I definitely should have asked you, but didn't? You you hit the nail on the head based on you know what I was able to provide you with in terms of context. Um, I that that I think the thing I was most curious about when when you asked me for for my social media links. Uh, was like, I was like, I wonder if he's going to notice Fun Times Funeral Home, if he's going to notice that I'm in that. Um, <laughs> so uh, I'm glad that you picked up on that. But yeah, I, I loved every question that you had um, during this session. It was really, it was really great to, 
sort of reflect back not only on my professional journey but my personal journey as well so yeah man you're you're doing such a wonderful job with this show keep doing it um it's a it's a great it's a great break in format from all of the other stuff that's out there especially since a lot of it is very resource focused um but taking the time to get to know these great individuals for the individuals that they are is super important so i love the i love the angle that you're coming into with community life it's uh is so refreshing to me. Yeah, thank you very much for all these kind words. And you know, Jeff, when I had this opportunity to have a um, speech on this conference with you and one more Jeff, it was very, it meant a lot for me because it was the first day I settled in Warsaw. And yes. it was like, you know, it was, it, it meant a lot to me and since that time, I was like, okay, I definitely have to talk to Jeffrey. I have to watch more. I have to like take more spots on him. And one day we'll definitely have this conversation. So, yeah. and finally we are. So thank you very much for your time. I'm super, I'm super honored. And it's super nice to get to know you closer. Likewise. And you're a great person, so thank Likewise. you very much thank for you so much. sharing all this, uh, all this stuff of uh, all this like small and very nice details about you. And I had a good laugh with you, so thank yeah. you very much for that. Likewise, I had plenty of laughs with you too, and I'm I'm so glad that we were able to connect at the moments that we were able to connect because, as you mentioned, you know, there were during moments where uh, I'm sure you must have been dealing with a lot and. Uh, I felt that in those moments where we would connect. So it was it was good to see you and, and to watch you go through those things. And I hope that now that you've come out on the other side of it, that everyone's doing well. Um, you know, all of my best wishes to you and your family um, and just hope everyone's doing well and, and, and uh, living their best lives. Totally. So I, I, I'm still keeping an eye on what you are, you and Ilker are working on and yes. in the community world. 